Awesome. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another round of our wonderful author interviews for our monthly donors. Um, I am here with Jesse Q. Sutanto. Um, Jesse, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm such a big fan of NaNoWriMo. Um, although for the longest time, I was pronouncing it NaNoWriMo. But <laughs> Very common. But anyway. We've heard it both ways. We've heard it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm the author of Dial A for Aunties um, and For Aunties and a Wedding, um, The Obsession, The New Girl, and Theo Tan and the Fox Spirit all beautifully set up right behind you with your yes. just stunning colorful color <laughs> covers awesome well thank you so much for joining us i am so excited to talk to you um i read dial a for aunties in march and i think i finished it like very fast like i read books fast but i finished it very fast and then i immediately yeah. made all my friends read it um and they also loved it so super excited to get to talk to you um We'll kind of start with, we'll, we'll get more into Dali for aunties and, and get into some of the questions there. Oh my gosh, Puppy. I'm so sorry. That's oh no, it's dog. okay. I kicked my oh, dog out because he'd be doing I'm the gonna, same thing. I'm going to get this. He's so <laughs> no worries. Oh my God. It's because someone, um, the front gate uh, opened. So she's like, <gasps> intruder. <laughs> Lily, come here. Come here. Come here. You're okay. You're okay. All right. The dog can join us. Place. Surprise! Test. I know. Yeah. Okay. I, I <laughs> oh man, I should have left my dog in here. He was like hanging out on my bed, and I was like, "Okay, get out!" <laughs> oh my goodness! Hello there. <laughs> goodness, she is a handful. Okay. Well, the dog can answer some questions too. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't have any prepared, so. Um, but I do have some prepared for you. Um, I'd love to hear more about just kind of your writing in general. Um, so maybe let's start out with, um, could you tell us when you began to write? Um, I guess I would say I started writing seriously after um, graduating from college. Um, because <laughs> that was when I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so not ready for the real world. Um, and so I started applying to grad schools and I got into, um, the, uh, creative writing program at Oxford. And so I would say that was when, you know, writing became a lot more serious for me. Um, that was a very long time ago. It was like, um, 14, 13 years ago, maybe. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. my gosh. So you had a long time mm -hmm. in between like your first yeah. published book and, and grad mm -hmm. school. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. Another interview. visitor. No it's worries. Totally. I'm having an interview. <laughs> oh, careful with the table. Okay, okay. Yeah, I know. Lily is just going to be here. She's very noisy. Okay. Sorry. About <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. I love surprise guests. That makes everything so much more fun. Um, <laughs> so kind of going, going, um, into that a little more, can you tell us about why you wanted to publish novels? Obviously, with a creative writing degree, that's not necessarily novel writing. Um, why novels mm -hmm. in particular? Um, so what was great about my program is that we had um, fiction writing, we had poetry, and I think we had a little bit of script writing. Um, and I quickly found out, you know, I was hopeless at the other two. I mean, I just, I remember like during our poetry um, section, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, poets, they're just a lot smarter. And, and um, I was like, my brain does not work that way. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give, like, I'm going to call it right now. I'm not going to make it as a poet. <laughs> it's hard. Poetry is so hard. Like, I, I am it definitely is. like with you. My brain does not work that way. Poets mm -hmm. have like a special language mm -hmm. that yeah. they, they just have imbued upon them. And yeah. when I write poetry, it sounds like I'm trying to write poetry. Yeah. That's, it's, that's not a feeling you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, um, I am also a really big fan of your Twitter page because you are hilarious. Um <laughs> But going into more kind of like the serious bits of writing, you have a really fantastic mm -hmm. Twitter thread on 
your how you outline a story. Um, I have it bookmarked mm-hmm. and I go back and reference it because I think it's super helpful. Um, can you walk mm-hmm. us through your outlining process? Yeah, so um, it took me a long time to come up with an outlining process. So when I first started writing, um, I was a full on pantser, um, which means that, you know, I didn't have an outline. I didn't know um, what was even going to happen in the scene. Um, And, you know, it worked for me then because I think I was still discovering um, how to write. Uh, And so I'm always very much of the opinion that, you know, um, there is no like correct writing method. Um, You always like kind of just do whatever works for you um, in that moment. Um, But I remember uh, at one point I was telling my husband, it's so tough. And then he was like, oh, why don't you try outlining? And I very angrily was like, that's not how I work. Um, (laughs) You don't understand my process. Just, you know, don't like, don't ruin it. And I was very defensive about it. And now I'm like, looking back, I'm like, why was I so defensive? Um, but anyway, um, I finally did try um, outlining and um, I tried several different methods. Um, so I finally have a method that works for me, which is um, kind of like a combination of save the cat, um, you know, with the beat sheets. Um, and but I also use um, other tools. So I have um, I have a document where I kind of like, um, do a thought vomit of everything that I, I have in my mind. Um, and it's literally like I'm typing stream of consciousness onto the page where I'm like, okay, this happens. And I type that down. I'm like, okay, this happens. Wait, but then what about this other thing? Or, you know, this other thing, and nothing gets censored out or um, cut out. It's just my thought vomit um, document. And then I also use um, Ginkgo app. Um, I don't know what the website is actually called. I think it's ginkgoapp.com. Okay. Um, and it's a free tool. Um, it has like these little cards that are um, separated in, into the Save the Cat beat sheets. Um, and it's so useful because you can move them around, you can add more cards. Um, and so once I have like all my thoughts down in my document, I, um, I copy paste, you know, the, the good ones that did work out onto the Ginkgo app. And I check it um, against like the beat sheets. I'm like, okay, is this you know, this is where the, the stakes are supposed to heighten. Um, is that doing that? And so I'm making sure that the pacing is working. Um, and then after I do that, <laughs> I write out a synopsis. And my synopsis is like about six to seven pages long. Um, and it's really useful to have a synopsis because I, I kind of cheat now, like, so I expect my books to be around 75 to 85,000 words. So then I divide it over, um, you know, how many pages my synopsis is. And then I'm like, okay, so each page of synopsis should be about, say, 12 to, you know, 14,000 words long. So as I'm writing, I'm like, okay, am I, am I there? You know, is this working out? And it's really helped because now my first drafts are generally, you know, pretty clean. I don't need to like hack and slash at it um, when I edit. Sorry, that was such a long answer. <laughs> no, I see. That's why I love it. Especially I remember, I feel like in your, in your Twitter thread, you also said something mm-hmm. along the lines of while you're putting different events together, you you'll have two events, but you'll basically have like a blank space in between. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And like, that's where you can get like really creative. Right. That was, I think that was like my favorite mm-hmm. part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I think that is, I, well, first off, I love save the cat. I think that is so helpful for anyone Mm -hmm. who has not read it. It's by Jessica Brody, um, modeled off of, I don't remember the original creator's name. Um, but very, very helpful. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it, um, now kind of continuing on with our writing advice, stream, Mm -hmm. stream consciousness, Mm -hmm. Um, what is a piece of writing advice that you feel isn't offered enough? 
um, lower your standards. That's actually one of my favorite writing. Ooh, books. okay. Expand upon that. I love that. So I uh, was writing my first book. It took me like three years to finish. Oh, um, wow. Partly, you know, because it was my first book. I was still trying to figure things out. But the other part was also because um, I kept thinking, you know, I'm writing a book. And what I had in mind as a book was, um, you know, the books that you see in like the shops, right? You're, you see like this final finished product. And so I was very much like, why is the thing I'm writing not at all like the books that I see in the stores? Um, and then I kind of realized, well, that's because the books in the stores have been through, you know, 10 rounds of edits. Um, they've been through entire teams of editors and copy editors and, and all these people. And whereas my thing is the first draft. So, you know, don't compare your first draft to someone else's final draft. Um, because I promise you their first draft did not look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was only when I, I gave myself permission to like, okay, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to write trash. And I literally say that to myself every day before I start writing, I say, I'm going to write trash. And somehow that's so freeing. Um, I can write whatever comes to my mind, you know, I can really let go. Um, I don't have to worry. And that's helped me write um, really fast, because I give myself permission um, to lower my standards. Oh, I love that. At NaNoWriMo, we call that banishing your inner editor. So mm, that is just yeah. the perfect way to go and write. And it's true. Like I, for on my end, I tell myself like, okay, nobody's going to see this. Like mm -hmm. in this form, no one's going to look at it as for you. And then you got to have more fun yeah. with it too, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Um, and getting into into the very details, kind of moving into Dally for aunties. Um, you've mentioned in several places, including, you know, your website and your Twitter, um, that oops, accidental murder is one of your favorite story tropes. Um, it's certainly not one that I see very often, <laughs> but I do see it pop up quite a lot in your books. Um, yeah. Can you can you talk to us about um, why you love employing that trope so much? Mm -hmm. So I have that in um, Ballet for Aunties. I also have that in The Obsession and The New Girl. <laughs> Lots of places. <laughs> uh, yeah. I love it because um, what I love about it is that then I get to have your everyday, um, normal, you know, typical person um, who wouldn't, you know, otherwise kill anyone. Um, but then then you pluck them out of their normal lives and just drop them into this horrible situation. And so I really like it because, um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of uh, murder stories already, uh, you, you have like a killer, you know, um, of a character, but I wanted to see how a normal person would react in that situation. Um, so I actually wrote, uh, the New Girl first, and then The Obsession um, before writing Dal A for Aunties. And I felt like with Dal A for Aunties, it was one step further because it was like accidental murder plus Chinese aunties. <laughs> and somehow it just works so well. <laughs> it, it really does. And we'll get even more into the details on that coming up um, just because I want to talk about a lot of those things. Um, mm -hmm. But before we do, before we get um, into Dali for Andy's completely. Um, what is a trope that you feel is in need of maybe some refreshing or a new take? Um, I have always loved um, friendship to love. Uh, your and then you share like um especially when there's like a certain depth and you know so many layers um and possibly years of friendship um behind that and um more and more lately I I've, I've been thinking like oh I really want to write a 
you know, friendship to lovers book. Um, especially because uh, my husband and I were friends um, for almost a year, I think, before, you know, we started dating. Um, and until now, when I chat with him, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm chatting with, you know, my best friend. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, I, you know, after so many years of marriage, um, I feel like, hmm, I really want to write this, like, friendship uh, love yeah oh that's so sweet I was w- mm-hmm. after after oops accidental murder that's not what I was expecting but I love that <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, I well I'm excited for you to write it I think there I do think there is like a little touch of that in dial mm-hmm. a for aunties so that mm-hmm. gives us a great segue to mm-hmm. um to talk about it so mm-hmm. for folks who haven't read the novel can you tell us what dial a for aunties is about yes so it's about a um, a young woman who accidentally kills her blind date um as you know as you do sometimes as you do uh, you and, know and then she calls <laughs> yes <laughs> And then she calls for help from her mom and her very meddlesome um, aunties, and they all come to her help. And uh, and then they have to kind of hide the body while also at the same time catering to the wedding of a billionaire family. Um, so all you know, normal rom com stuff. <laughs> it's murder. <laughs> Oops. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a it's a great ride. I am restraining myself from from talking too much about it because I think a lot of it it's like so twisty and we'll get into the twist later mm-hmm. but I don't want to give anything away to at least too much for the people who haven't mm-hmm. read it because it is so fun and it takes you so many places um can you mm-hmm. talk to us about what inspired you to write Dialy for aunties so I've been wanting to write um about uh, my family, I guess, for the longest time. Um, you know, my husband, he's English. And so when we moved to Indonesia, um, there were a lot of moments where he was like, oh my gosh, you need to write about this. You know, people would just be like, what? And I'm like, wow, what do you mean? It's normal. My family is so boring and normal. And he's like, they are not boring or normal. You need to write about them. <laughs> um but then whenever I tried writing about them um it always hit too close to home like the family drama and everything so I was like I don't know it's too sore you know I don't it's like stressing me out Mm -hmm. um and so I kind of put it aside and then one day I was like wait a minute what about like my favorite trope which is accidental murder um you know meets my family and then it just flowed like it flowed so smoothly every every scene when I was plotting it I was like okay and then what happens and then I just kind of had to sit back and think well how would my aunties react in this situation and and then it just came out and I was like okay (laughs) that's I love it so much oh my god um so kind of going off of that, one of the major themes of this novel is family. And I really felt like that was the heart and soul of the novel. I think that's mm-hmm. really one of the ways that you can maybe capture some more out there concepts like the oops, mm-hmm. accidental murder really well, because it balances mm-hmm. out. Um, what were some ideas about family that you knew you wanted to incorporate in the novel before you started writing it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I definitely knew that I wanted her family um, to kind of drop everything and come to her aid. Um, that was the first thing I, I just knew that they would do. Um, and then the other thing that was so funny was that I, I did not foresee every auntie having like a grudge, you know, against another auntie, even though that is how it is in my family. But I didn't know that until I started writing um, so I had finished outlining and then I was starting to write. None of the aunties had their personalities when I was outlining. They were just like, um, okay, this auntie, you know, one, two, three, four. Um, but when I started writing, I was like, oh, right. Well, yeah, the first aunt is, you know, the leader 
and um, you know, second aunt is always trying to become the leader, and and then you know, fourth aunt and the mom have like this rivalry um, going on. Like that all just came out when I started writing, and I was like, oh my god, of course they all have this. <laughs> the shifting alliances and oh, yeah, and the battles, yeah. And I think it, it lends to so much depth because so often, you know, we think of a story and we just think of what's going on in a story, but all these characters, yeah. they've all had lives beforehand. So having those yeah. grudges, having that background with those characters, mm-hmm. it just, it makes it, it makes it so you get a step into the world rather than just reading about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very, and then also um, going back to co- sort of the, the family and the chaos piece, can you speak to, I guess, the harmony Um, between the chaos that the plot brings and then the heart your character brings your characters bring to the novel as a whole so yeah I mean um, so growing up I you know I'm I have a huge family um, and it was something I really disliked uh, when I was growing up because I felt like there was just so much chaos Um, you know we would have these huge huge family meals and everyone is like shouting over everyone else. And, um, and there was a lot of like, you know, um, a culture of, Oh gosh, you know, what would your aunts and uncles think, you know, or what would people say? And, and a lot of stuff like that. So there was, you know, a lot of judgment. Um, And so I really didn't like that. Um, But then after I um, moved away for like, oh, we're just alone in the world. And, you know, what was I? And um, we all came back. Like we all, every single one of us came back to Indonesia, even though we were like, you know, when we left, we were like, we're never coming back. <laughs> but, you know, like I tried living overseas. I tried living in England and I was miserable. Oh, and I was like, I'm coming back. And we all came back. And um, now we're raising our kids in that same chaotic um, environment. And I realized like, yeah, I mean, I would choose this um, over, um, you know, having a small family. Um, So that was kind of what I wanted to convey um, with the family dynamics. You know, I wanted to show like the the struggle of wanting to break free, but then also kind of accepting that, um, you know, there's like a lot of good to be had from like a close knit family. (laughs) Absolutely. And it it really does come across so strong. And these characters, you can just tell like, (laughs) yeah, they they get annoyed with each other, but they love each other Mm -hmm. so, so much. Like that family bond is there. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving into more of the murdery bits of the story, um, you, I think you've really turned the mystery genre on its head in Dialy for Aunties. Um, I know it's not like really classified mm-hmm. as a mystery, but we know who died. We know who accidentally killed him mm-hmm. and we know why. So we yeah. have this murderer murdered whole setup. Um, can you talk to us, um, about sort of the knowledge you equip your readers with? Um, despite all, everything that you give the reader, how do you continue to engage the reader, even though they know everything already? Mm-hmm. Um, so when I wrote it, um, yeah, I guess you can't really call it a mystery. It's, I think my publisher calls it a comedy caper. Uh- <laughs> yeah, yes, I would agree with that very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And the question becomes um, not not solving the mystery because as you said, we know everything. Um, and the question is, are they gonna get away with it? Mm-hmm. And um, so when I was, so I only plotted it up to about um, 75% of the way. And then I, you know, because I was following the rule of like um, in every situation, make things worse for your characters so I was just continuously making things worse for them up until 75 percent and I was like oh my gosh I mean things are so bad for them now um 
it is so bad. I don't know how they're going to get out of it. And um, I really, you know, I, my friend was like, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? I was like, well, the worst thing that can happen is that they go to prison. Um, but then that would be, you know, a very different story. Um, and so I was like, I really need to, you know, find out how it's going to work out for them. But um, by then I was, I kind of also realized like, oh, I'm so invested in these characters' um, fate, you know, because I care um, about them. And so then I realized like, oh yeah, that's the key um, to making the readers um, still interested in reading, even though you know uh, the mystery, there is no mystery. Um, it's that they need to find, they need to want to find out what happens to the characters if everything works out for them or not. Um, and so I, I really um, kind of hit home, you know, that as I was writing, I was like um, very clear about making the stakes like as uh, present as possible, they could go to prison at any time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that I would say that just continues on throughout the book. And you're like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like things get a little calm and then they bump up again and that just continues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why I finished the book so fast. <laughs> um, yes, I love all of that. Um, so kind of going off of that genre thing still, are there any other genres that you maybe want to reinvent like this, kind of turn them on their head? Um, uh... I haven't really thought of like reinventing um, a genre in that way because, and even with ballet for aunties, I feel like it kind of happened by accident because I kept telling my friends, you know, I'm going to write a rom-com. I'm writing a rom-com um, that just happens to have murder. And then it ended up not being a rom-com, you know, like it's, you know, there's romance, but the romance isn't the main plot. So it it kind of happened um, naturally. Um, but uh, the next adult book I have coming out, um, I'm not quite sure what genre it is. I think it might be a cozy mystery and I'm very excited about it. Um, and I think it will definitely appeal um, to fans of Dal A for Aunties. Uh, it's about an old, um, a little old Chinese lady who lives in uh, <laughs> San Francisco above her little and um, went downstairs to body in the shop to investigate um, this death because uh, buddy gets out a wrongdoing better than a suspicious Chinese mother. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so great. I'm uh, it's it's knives meets kiss convenience. So I'm very excited about it. Oh, wow. I, I am also very excited about it. I think you, you <laughs> announced that very recently, right? A couple months yes. ago, maybe. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's very exciting. I'm, it sounds a lot like that life for aunties in the best yes. way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's see, we lost my spot. Doo -doo. Oh yeah. Um, so I touched on this a little before, but the twist that Dalai for aunties has is they're just, they're so fun and they're so incredible. Um, and I think that really lends to its quick, but still like at a good pace pace. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really hard to put this book down. How do you plan those twists that are surprising or exciting, surprising and exciting and believable, but not predictable? Um, there, I think, and uh, a lot of the twists came up um, because I knew where the story needed to go, but then, and then other twists kind of just came up organically. So for example, um, I knew that I wanted the, the main story to, um, uh, to be set at a wedding. So I was like, well, then I to get to the, and so that, that brought them to the wedding 
I had to come because I was like, I'm there. Um, I was just outlining and I was like, how can I make the scene uh, even worse for them? So then I was like, oh, I know um, these other side characters can come in um, to play. And yeah, so it was um, like with these twists, I, you know, I try to be as flexible uh as I can. And um, I guess my, my writing tip is, you know, just try many different methods. Like maybe you want to think about, well, where do I want a, the story to go? And how can I create a twist that gets me there? Um, or sometimes you're just like, what could be really fun here? <laughs> what can make this story like even that. more fun and crazy? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that's so, yeah, I, I think a lot of people have a hard time building in twists that mm -hmm. that they find like both believable and also not predictable, right? Because they're like, well, what what if people like predict this? What if it's not actually a twist and it kind of falls flat? But kind of that like mm -hmm. balanced method of coming up organically and making sure that stuff is still very intense, I think is a great thing that people can remember. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, how how do you space out your twists so they don't feel maybe rushed, like one right after the other, a whole bunch of times, mm -hmm. or out of place? Mm -hmm. um, um, so I find the Ginkgo app really useful um, in this way because, um, you know, like I said, they, they have like these note cards that, um, and each note card has like a guide, a save the cat guide. So it's like, Um, bad guys closing in they kind of guide um, so it kind of lets you know um, where you should kind of be in your story um, that really helps me because I have this um, you know the really always like I kind of um, as right, you know, I have like, oh, this is so boring, so rushing, you know, because I always feel like, oh, nobody wants to read about this. And so I'm like, uh, my scenes are very short. And then I end up with like first drafts that are only 40,000 words long. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and so uh, it really helps to kind of have a guide of like, okay, so this is time for another twist. And then this twist should last them, I don't know, like 3,000 words, you know, before I can introduce the next twist or, you know, something like that. Okay, so it's more of a science, really, than an art, huh? Yeah. Awesome. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, for me, I feel like it is, I just need that. Oh, uh, I think that's sorry. I think there's like a massive lag now. Oh no. Um, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's just an internet problem. That's okay. I think being two and a half years into a pandemic, we're all very used to mm -hmm. fun internet problems. It yeah. just, it just spices up the conversation, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Um, now final question. Um, for Dialy for aunties and also for aunties in a wedding, because I am a third of the way into that right now. Um, did you pull anything in from your um, wedding day into either of those two books? Um, let me think. From my own one, it was just like um, so we we did have um, like a wedding celebration, like a wedding reception, and in Indonesia and so we did have the huge Indonesian wedding um oh, wow. where you know we had like a thousand two hundred guests at ours um but because my husband is English he had like 12 people um from his side of the family and oh my, my parents I remember they were just like this is so embarrassing can't he just rustle up like you know, at least, um, I don't know, like 500 more people are wedding, your wedding is so empty. And um, we even had trouble 
uh, finding a ballroom that was small enough um, for our wedding because most ballrooms are designed to have at least 2,000 guests. And, um, and every ballroom we saw were, was just so big. And then everyone was like, oh, you're going to have like a thousand? That's going to look so empty and sad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so I really wanted to incorporate like how um, overwhelming, uh, you know, these weddings can be. Um, and then for four aunties and a wedding, I was uh, a wedding photographer in England for a while. And so uh, I knew a lot about like English uh, style, you know, weddings. And so I, oh, wow. I, I mostly incorporated that into four aunties and a wedding because oh, it does fantastic. take place in Oxford. It does. It does. It does. Well, I'm excited to finish that one. I had to, I took a break last mm-hmm. week, was on vacation, and I just didn't pick up a book for whatever reason, <laughs> but I'm so excited <laughs> to finish it. Um, awesome. So we're going to move on to some of your other stuff, just kind of general stuff I've thrown in here. Um, and looking, mm-hmm. we can see looking um, behind you at all the books that you have, um, to say you're a prolific writer is probably an understatement. Um, if we look at just 2021 and 2022 together, you'll have released six books by the end of the year, which is incredible. And I don't, I can't even think of another author who has done that, quite frankly. And you have another coming out in early 2023. Um, how is my first question? <laughs> um, and and how, how long did it take you to write these first six books? Mm-hmm. Um, so how <laughs> is actually why I was such a big fan of NaNoWriMo, yeah. uh, because, so yeah, I told you how my first book, um, took three years to write. And, uh, during that time, I, I got to know a few, um, writers, uh, from the writing community. And one of them was like, let's do NaNoWriMo. And I was like, no, no, art cannot be rushed. I'm an artist. Um, <laughs> And she was like, we're doing, we're doing it. Um, so my second book, uh, and that was the first time that I kind of learned to let go of everything and just write really fast. And so I actually ended up um, writing the entire thing within the um, that month. And um, it was just so amazing. I, I mean, the story was a mess, but... Um, I also thought that the writing was actually better than the first book um, because I I was really able to just let everything out. And I was like, wow, wow, this is so, it's so uh, uh, freeing. And so ever then um, were written really fast um, and, uh, you know, under like two months or something. So that one I got, um, I got really good at doing. And then, um, then the next step was to um, learn how to outline um, so that my drafts were a lot cleaner because the problem I had was that, you know, it would take me two months to um, draft, but then it would take me like a year to edit because the story was such a mess. Um, and so what really helped was learning how to outline, come up with a cleaner draft and then learning how to edit um, in a more efficient way. Um, so then now about two months to and edit. Um, so like Dal A for aunties, it took like months before I could send it to my agent. Um, and then, so it was very, it was very fast. Um, and it also took me, uh, like eight years to get some deal. So that time I had a lot of, you know, I wrote a lot of books. Um, most of them died on submissions. So they, they're just not going to see the light of day, um, which is fine because then it uh, allowed me um, to learn to move on to the next project. So uh, once I'm done with a book, I'm like, okay, I'm moving on to the next one and to the next one. And that's kind of been what I've been doing. And I think that that's how, you know, you kind of protect yourself against like the heartache that comes with trying to, um, be published. Yeah. (laughs) 
Well, I like all of the lessons that you've given us a lot. Lower your standards move on from your writing and write trash. And those are really wonderful because mm-hmm. obviously it works for mm-hmm. you. So yeah. it's going to work for somebody else. Might not work for everybody, but it's going to work for somebody yeah. else. Yes. <laughs> if yes. nothing else, that sounds like it makes writing just more fun. Honestly, you got to do it for yourself, yeah. not mm-hmm. for the eventual maybe end product. Yeah. Um, so yeah. kind of in addition to, you know, yeah. you wrote a few books during NaNoWriMo. We right now in July have a lot of writers in the middle of camp NaNoWriMo. Do you have a piece of advice mm-hmm. other than those three that I just listed off um, that you would like to share with them? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the best things that you can do is, is to try and find a to do um, you know, NaNoWriMo or Camp NaNoWriMo with, um, whether it's through, you know, the official um, NaNoWriMo. I, I was just so into NaNoWriMo. Um, I had like the, you know, the word counters and everything and the badges. I, I just love NaNoWriMo so much. Um, so anyway, uh, so find your community um, or try to do it with a friend. That's also really good. Um, but be very careful when you do it with a friend. Make sure it's someone who is as motivated as you are. Because I've done, um, you know, writing sprints with friends before that weren't as into it. And then, like, you know, I come back and they're like, oh, I didn't do my words today. I, um, you know, I, I had a tough day or, or whatever, which is fine. But it can be very demoralizing. Um, so try and find someone who is as uh, intense as you <laughs> Same intensity level. I yeah, agree with that yes. completely. Yeah. I I had lots of friends who I dragged through NaNoWriMo in high school or mm-hmm. undergrad. And I think I'm still the only one who's still doing it. <laughs> Everyone else is like, no, I have life. I'm like, okay, yeah. got to find a new crew. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it is so much easier when you have people who understand mm-hmm. like what you're trying to do and they are also yes. trying to do the same thing. It's, yeah. it's nice to have that community. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that I remember loving about NaNoWriMo was that I was, um, I was on Absolute Rights, which is uh, a forum. It's free. And they have like a whole um, subsection of the forum is dedicated to NaNoWriMo. Okay. And um, they have like threads that are like last line of the day. And then they have like best line of the day. And it was just so fun to be able to share that at the end of, you know, each writing uh, session. Um, and people were very supportive. Um, you know, they were always like, oh, this book sounds so funny or whatever. So um, I encourage you to find something like that where, you know, you can share little bits of your um, writing day, uh, and just kind of get feedback, like positive feedback. I don't think this is the time for any critique. <laughs> no critiques during NaNoWriMo. Oh, that's yeah. great. I feel like, I feel like NaNo should start one of those, like officially going to pass yeah. that idea along. Oh, that'd be yes. so great. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Got a new thing to do. Work. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm sure all of your advice is really going to help all of our writers. Um, and now my next question is, can you talk to us about your upcoming books? You've already touched on one of them. Um, Vera Wong's unsolicited advice for murders is that is mm-hmm. the one that takes place in the tea shop, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So a dial for aunties in another city. I, I am from the Bay area. So when you said San Francisco, I had not heard that before. So that is very exciting. I'm about 30 mm-hmm. minutes outside of San Francisco. Um, and your next book, um, and I believe this comes out in September, but please correct me if I'm mm-hmm. wrong, is called Well, That Was Unexpected. Can you talk to us about that one? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, my YA rom-com, and I'm so excited about it. It's about um, uh, two teenagers whose parents uh, feel very strongly about them dating the right people and so it's kind of like dial a for aunties I guess with the meddlesome parents um, but minus the murder and uh, 
Um, and uh, I'm very excited because the the female main character, she gets whisked away from LA um, to Indonesia. And so the book takes place in Indonesia. We're going to go to um, Jakarta and then to Bali, um, where she kind of learns, uh, you know, about the place and falls in love with it. Um, that sounds great. I'm, I yeah, have so many great excited. books coming out in September and my to be read list is, is so ready to <laughs> be less than it is, even though it never, never decreases. I at least get to read some great books. So that's so mm-hmm. exciting. I also wanted to shout out your TikToks because like I've said before, I think you are absolutely hilarious especially the ones that involve impersonations of your family. Yeah. Really, I could not think of a good question to ask just because they're just so entertaining. They're so perfect on their own. I just want more people to watch them and enjoy them. Oh my and gosh. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. I was watching. I really appreciate that because I get in trouble with my mom every time I post one of those. So I always, I always think, I'm like, does her mom like these? Does she not like these? But they're so fun. And they're so like, just sweet and similar to Sally for aunties. There's so much heart there. And I think that's kind of the, the core of it. So you can get away with a little more poke and fun. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions I have for you, but I do have a quiz game that I've not shared any questions with you. Um, Mm -hmm. But let me pull it up on the screen. Um, that was a bad thing to do first. Okay. Share screen. I'm always so slow with this. Share (laughs) (laughs) this one. Share and full screen. Okay. I see it. Oh no, we're on the, okay. That was the answer. Hopefully you didn't get to read it, but if okay. it's okay. No, I didn't get to read it. Okay, no. cool. <laughs> so this is wedding traditions from around the world. They'll either be true or false, or it'll be one uh, out of four potential answers. Um, so this first one, this Norwegian tradition Ooh. is meant to keep evil spirits away with jingling noises. Is it bells carried by bridesmaids, keys given to the couple by their families, groomsmen mm-hmm. clinking glasses, or the bride's crown with dangling charms? I'm going to go with A, bells carried by bridesmaids, because I feel like a lot of um, tradition relies on like... Um, the woman's like friends like so the bridesmaids to kind of protect her (laughs) that that is actually the answer is not true but you're so right with those traditions like I know brides and their bridesmaids they wear veils Mm -hmm. like they all used to wear veils to like protect the bride from like demons or something and my friend was like I am not doing veils because that's creepy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, the answer is um, the bride's crown with dangling charms. So the bride wears a silver and gold crown with little tiny charms on it. And then when she moves, the sound is supposed mm-hmm. to deflect evil spirits. I love that. Right? I want a shiny crown. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next one. Oh, and there's only six questions. So it's not, it doesn't take forever. Um <laughs> True or false, in Venezuela, it's good luck for the newlyweds to sneak away from the reception before it ends without alerting any party goers. Huh. Um, Okay, I'm going to go with true just because it's so interesting. It has to be true. It is true. Yes. So (laughs) they they can just like bounce from their own wedding party, which I think is so fascinating. Um, It's good Mm -hmm. luck to sneak away before the party ends without getting caught. But it's also good luck um, for whatever guest catches on that they're gone. Oh, that's so funny. That's like a little game at the end of the wedding. Yeah, the guest needs to um, get a prize. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. These are so fun. I had a lot of fun putting yeah. this together. <laughs> um, next question. This Congolese tradition prevents couples from doing what during their wedding celebration? Looking at each other, dancing together, smiling, or eating while the sun is up? I'm going to go with cease smiling because I know that in quite a few traditions, it's like considered 
um, unlucky or like just bad form to smile during your wedding. You are correct. Um, yes! They have to keep their, yeah, they have to keep yeah. their happiness in check because it means if they smile, they're not serious about marriage. So that's interesting that a that's lot so of cultures, maybe not a lot, but like some yeah. other cultures have this too. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. Alrighty, next question. True or false? In Mexico, the couple is shrouded in yards of white lace as they take their vows. Hmm. Um, I'm going to go with false because I, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of this. I'm going to go false. You are correct. Um, it's Yay! not white lace. Oh my God, I'm doing so well. <laughs> You're doing so well. It's great. <laughs> Uh, it's not white lace. It's actually um, a lasso or lazo uh, made of rosary beads and flowers mm -hmm. that's wrapped in a figure eight Aww. while they're saying their vows. Yeah, it's meant to um, resemble Aww. the infinity symbol, signifying how long their marriage is going to oh, last. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All righty. In the Philippines, what do the bride and groom release into the sky after getting married? Uh, two doves, butterflies kites or fireworks hmm. oh this is so tough um oh. um two doves you are correct they Yay! release two doves you really are like just killing it here yes <laughs> um they release a male and a female dove and they're meant to represent oh. a harmonious life together they're just these are yeah. so sweet <laughs> and then yeah. finally I put this last one in here especially for Dali for aunties <laughs> true or false during Chinese tea ceremonies there are no rules about the type of oh tea consumed gosh. during the ceremony and many people choose the tea based on personal preference oh my gosh I'm gonna like get the one about this one, <laughs> one wrong um uh, I'm gonna go with false just because I know that there are so many rules. So why not this one as well? <laughs> you are incorrect. The answer is true. So there's actually no rules. And this is from no! um, a, like a wedding consultant. Um, so I don't know, maybe uh -huh. some other people are like, no, you always have to choose this tea. But this wedding consultant oh, said gosh. there are no rules and people do choose based on what they would like. Um, red dates, lotus mm -hmm. seeds, and lily are all added to the tea, signifying luck, arrival Ooh. of children. Um, and then the Chinese name of lily flower rhymes with an expression uh, meaning marriage longevity. Aww, that's yeah. nice. So nice. The, I had, <laughs> there were so many to choose from. And I was like, I can't, I didn't I realize. They were, there were like this many fun traditions around the world. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I don't know how you found out all about these, but that was so a, fun. A fun Google search. Um, stop <laughs> sharing. Awesome. Well, that concludes our our interview. The one last thing I do kind of want to tell you is, so I recommended um, this book to one of my best friends and she's actually my maid of honor. Mm -hmm. I'm getting married next year. Oh. Um, and she comes from a mixed background. She's Chinese, Filipina, and white. And she's been one of my closest mm -hmm. friends for like a really, really, really long time. Um, and just, I, I made her, I made her read this and she was like, okay, I'm so excited. Um, cause it's about a mixed family. Mm -hmm. Um, and so hearing her talk about this book and just like the deep ways that she felt connected to this book and she felt seen by this book was just Aww. so, so, so incredible. Um, I got to hear things about like her life that I had never even like, you don't know that you don't know. So oh, I wasn't wow, even able to that's ask. Amazing. So it was just, mm -hmm. I just thank you for, for letting me learn oh, more about her. Oh my gosh, that's so wonderful. And congratulations on thank your you. upcoming wedding. Yeah. That's so exciting. <laughs> Hopefully there will be no accidental murder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jesse. I really, really appreciate your time today. Um, thanks for all the books that you put out into the world. I'm excited um, to see more of them coming out. Um, I also want to thank Catherine, who's been working behind the scenes to keep this going along. And of course, um, I'd love to thank our monthly donors um, who sponsor these uh, author interviews. Um, with that, that is all we have for you today. Um, 